setting fire to the stoner stereotype, sparking up candid conversations with cannabis researchers, entrepreneurs, and advocates. Educator, author, and advocate Dr. Mitch Earlywine is here to tackle the burning issues. CannabisRadio.com presents a no-holds-barred platform that seeks to redefine and revolutionize the entire scope of the cannabis culture while opening the door for more to join the cannabis crusade. Please welcome the host of Burning Issues, Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Hey, I'm Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Thanks for joining us on Burning Issues. As most of you know, I'm professor of psychology at the University of Albany, author of Understanding Marijuana, charity of the executive board at Normal, and I pen the Ask Dr. Mitch column for High Times Magazine. Today, we're going to chat with High Times guru Rick Cusick, have our regular segment on self-compassion and the art of activism, and we'll burn away more cannabis myths with science. So here he is, High Times associate publisher, legendary reporter, accomplished auctioneer, and consummate storyteller, Rick Cusick. Well, how could I possibly live up to that introduction? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining us. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say everyone listening has probably fantasized about working for High Times. Can you yeah, tell us how you the, ended up there? I have the best job in the world. Everybody... Uh, says that, and everybody is right. Um, how do you get your job at High Times Magazine? The answer is luck. Um, about 18 years ago, I was working for a First Amendment magazine, working for them, and they asked me to interview George Carlin. And uh, I did, and George and I became friends. And uh, then about a year later, my kid was born, and I needed a real job. And they said, hey, why don't you ask George Carlin if he would talk about pot, if I can get you in High Times. And George said yes. And uh, that was my first cover for High Times, and within a month, they hired me. That's a great tale. Oh, man, delightful. Yeah, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. (laughs) (laughs) Sad but true. And it sounds like High Times' reach is extending all the time. Can you give us sort of the updates on how it's all going and what it's getting into? Yeah, it's an amazing ride. Uh, Always has been an amazing ride, but particularly it's taking off like a rocket right now. Um, you know, pretty much 40, we're into our 40th anniversary for 40 years without fail, never once, uh, missing a a deadline. We were out every month, um, slamming the, uh, the news that marijuana should be legalized. And now we're actually at that moment when knock on wood, it looks like, uh, we're going to get to that moment, and we're going to get to that place. And um, it's legalized in several states, and it's medicalized in several dozen states, and and now we're exporting it to uh, other countries. Our legalization campaigns are exporting to other countries as well. So High Times is in the center of all that. And uh, I feel like we've been waiting for this for 40 years. I've certainly been waiting for it for 20 years. Well, so it sounds like the uh, the reach for the Cannabis Cup is also extending. Can you give us any hints about how that's going? Yeah, every bit of it. That's what I'm saying. Um, all The water is rising, so all the boats are lifting. Uh, High Times, the magazine, has never been fatter, has never been a better magazine. Um, it, it's now uh, producing a magazine where in the past it was a It was the largest niche magazine in the world. Now it's maybe the smallest mainstream magazine in the world. And uh, on top of that, we've had the Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam for 28 years. And about five years ago, owing to the medical medical miracles that have happened out in the West, uh, we started bringing the Cannabis Cups to uh, the medical states. And then in when Denver went, uh, Colorado went legal, we brought uh, the High Times uh, U.S. Cannabis Cup to Denver. And it went from, you know, the first one was maybe two, 3,000 people in San Francisco, and four years later, we had 40,000 people in Denver. Holy and, uh, cow. Yeah, well, I think we've actually, this particular 420, we probably passed over 50,000. We'll know pretty soon. But uh, it's just ridiculous. Suddenly, we're an event company as well as a magazine and media company. Well, what would somebody expect to experience if they made it to a cup? Ah, lots of weed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, pretty much. I mean, the Cannabis Cup, uh, in tradition, uh, has been the number one marijuana um, uh, 
competition in the world, and we've always had a celebration and expo attached to that competition. So that's pretty much what we uh, how we, how we break it down. Uh, we have a competition where every cup that we have, and we bring in the the best legal marijuana, um, whether it's medical or whether in the cases of the legal states it's legal marijuana, and we judge it with expert uh, with expert uh, panels of judges, and all of that is known a week before we start the process, a week before the actual cup, and the night before the cup starts, we know who the the uh, winners are, and then the next day. You get to go to the Cannabis Cup, and you spend two days in an expo. You have seminars. You have an indoor area where we have the best machinery and the best goods and services and such that's available in, in the cannabis space. And then usually outside, we create um, outdoor open-air parking lot areas where people uh, the proper age or the proper cars, depending on the law, can go out there and indulge with their favorite plant and some of the best purveyors in the world of that plant. It's uh, if you're a if you're a marijuana smoker, the cannabis cup should be on your bucket list. <laughs> Absolutely. And now, are there more uh, news on the international front that you might be able to share share with us? Yeah, you know, I, I again, all the waters lifting and the boats are rising. Um, it, it you know, it, backing up for a moment, when when the United States started its war against marijuana. Uh, as you well know, because you've been on the forefront of this particular part of it, it was not just a war against the plant. It was a war against information. And, and well, we knew the truth, and they took the truth and tossed it away and replaced it with lies. And so systematically for 40 years, um, they've been, well, for now almost for 80 years, the United States has been pushing out its lies, and for 40 years we've been pushing the opposite of that. Now finally... 50% over 50% of the American public have come to agree with us that marijuana should be legalized. That being said, we exported our prohibition to the rest of the world. After we prohibited it in the United States, Harry Anslinger made sure it was exported to the entire world. And um, now the entire world, they see us turning around, the entire world is also thinking about turning around. And in the past four or five months, um, I've been deeply involved with bringing the World Cannabis Cup to Negril, Jamaica on November 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th. And uh, that is the most surreal thing I can possibly say. <laughs> the, the idea of a Cannabis Cup going to Negril and uh, being uh, partnered, we're going to do it in partnership with the Rastafarian uh, uh, cohorts down there. And uh, right now, Jamaica has decriminalized two ounces, has made allowances for medical marijuana, uh, is going to make reciprocity for medical cards coming into the country. So if you have a medical card in the United States, your medical card will be honored in Jamaica. Um, they are going to welcome uh, foreign capital and foreign cannabis businesses to come in and create commercial entities for export. And they have given the Rastafarians their indig their uh, religious rights. So, it's so uh, amazing, Rick. I I, I got to admit, everybody thought cannabis was already legal there in Jamaica. Can you yeah. talk about how that all got started and how it uh, evolved? Yeah, you know, the funny thing is people say, oh, you know, I've been going down there and smoking for years, going down to Sunsplash, and they, they smoke there. Yeah, that's true. But um, in the past, the police have looked the other way. This time, November 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th, they're going to be right there, and it's going to be a legal event. And that is historic. You've really been spearheading a lot of this and in the movement a lot. I know you're also on the board for the Normal Women's Alliance. I've asked yep. a lot of women on the show, you know, is it different for men and women in reform? And I'd be curious to get your take on it. Yeah, you know. I'll tell you how they offered uh, me a board spot on the uh, Normal Women's Alliance was because I sat down one day and spoke with uh, a couple of the uh, board members there, and I, I had my own take on on the breakdown between male and female. If you look at um, uh, U.S. government figures, which are, are not accurate, but they give us a place to have a conversation, um, they say that uh, 27, 30 million Americans smoke marijuana at least once a year. 17 million will smoke it once a month. Three to five million will smoke it every day. 
But interestingly enough, if you look at those numbers, um, they would they would say that of most 30 million that smoke it once a year, it's about 50-50, 50% men, 50% women. And if you're looking for the breakdown of daily smokers, of the 3 to 5 million that smoke it every day, it's 80% men and 20% women. So when they say marijuana is a boys' club, well, it is if you're talking about smokers every day, people who define themselves as marijuana smokers. And so it's not just a matter of... But if you're but if you're talking about the the overall number of people in the United States that smoke, it's basically fifty fifty. So that's why we we think of marijuana as a, a male dominated sport, if you will. But in fact, um, is some of the best uh, movers and shakers in this industry, in this movement, and in the cultivation of the plant have all been women um, that, that have been among that fifty fifty cohort that like to smoke it. So it's it's an interesting breakdown, um, and we're going to uh, you're going to see more and more of the feminine force coming through in cannabis as it becomes legalized, as the as the outlaw bona fides become less. <laughs> it's uh, that's why that's why the eighty percent of males is because it's an easy way to prove your outlaw bona fides when you're eighteen, nineteen, <laughs> twenty-one, twenty years old. You know exactly. And, uh, and that's, that's it. That's why. And so now that we're going into a legal space where, where it's going to become more mainstream acceptance, you're going to see that 50-50 breakdown assert itself more than the 80-20 breakdown. Uh, I think you're absolutely on the money there. I know you've done a lot of cool presentations on drug testing, and I was curious how that's changed over the years and how you see it. Oh, drug testing. You know, I mean, that's the real uh, real bugaboo as we go into legalization. Because first of all, you got to remember, just because we're legalizing and just because we're winning doesn't mean it's over. And the, the forces against marijuana are still out there, and they're still very, very uh, aggressive in what they want to do. So as we win, as our truths become self-evident, um, they're going to rely more and more on their greatest hits, and one of their greatest hits is drug testing. And the reason why drug testing was such a great hit for the anti-marijuana forces is because it created a brand new multi-billion dollar industry that everybody was happy to jump on, and uh, it only made sense if you included marijuana in the drug testing. If you were just drug testing for uh, you know, uh, other drugs, heroin or per prescription drugs or cocaine, there's not enough to actually make a billion dollar industry. But if you put that 30 million Americans or 17 million monthly Americans who smoke marijuana, now you really have a drug testing industry. And that's what happened. But the problem is, there's no way to tell through any kind of drug test that we are applying in the workplace or anything short of a blood test, there's no way to tell if somebody is under the influence of marijuana. We can tell if they're under the influence of, of uh, alcohol, and uh, we can tell if they're under the influence of other drugs, but we can't tell because marijuana stays in the system. You can smoke it on Friday night and test positive for it on, uh, on Monday or Tuesday. And if you smoke it a lot, it'll stay in your system for up to 30 days. The other drugs they disappear quickly. And when somebody's drunk, it's very obvious. So they built this billion-dollar industry on faulty science, and now that we're legalizing, now that people are will be smoking marijuana legally, they have to come up with a better way of doing drug testing. And unfortunately, there's a billion-dollar industry that wants to keep things just as they are. So as I say, as we move into this future space, there's lots of challenges ahead. And one of the biggest ones is to negotiate a real world drug test policy that is fair to society, but also fair to the legal marijuana smokers. I, I couldn't agree more, Rick. And I uh, got to take a break here just a second. But uh, we're going to talk more about some drug testing and some other big burning issues and great tales from Rick Cusick of High Times Magazine. Uh, please come right back. More burning issues coming up after we blaze through these words from our sponsors. 
your connection to quality cannabis insurance services is spelled K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R. That's Karcher Insurance. We have worked with ventures like cannabis for over 60 years. We're proud to represent over 50 companies with tailor-made cannabis plans for owners just like you to ensure your product, your plants, and your pursuits. K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R spells out their full-service insurance services, ranging from commercial to bonds to personal, from life to health, and more. Contact the team at KarcherInsurance.com and let our experience work for you. That's K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R Insurance.com. Contact Karen and the team at Karcher Insurance at 1-844-421-3560. That's 844-421-3560. It's time to check in with Doc Rob and the Concierge for Better Living. We take a real, raw, inside look at healthier living while sharing great ideas and improvements for a better quality of life. The Concierge for Better Living will help informed, intrigued, and interested listeners like you make better choices for yourselves and your loved ones. The Concierge for Better Living with Doc Rob. Only on CannabisRadio.com. Hi, I'm Montel Williams. Most of you know me as a talk show host, but I'm also an author, actor, single father of four, avid snowboarder, and I'm also a medical marijuana patient. Living with multiple sclerosis, I'm in pain every day. Medical marijuana is my last resort, and it helps me when all other drugs have failed. If you'd like more information about medical marijuana, you can contact the Marijuana Policy Project at mpp.org or call 1-877-JOIN-MPP. Time to fan the fire on some more burning issues, only on CannabisRadio.com. Hey, welcome back to Burning Issues. We're talking to Rick Cusick of High Times Magazine. He had just mentioned that uh, we've got some crazy history behind uh, drug testing, and we should really move towards uh, competence in your job, not what's the content of your urine. Rick, I know you've seen some pretty crazy urine tests uh, over the years. Anything you'd want to comment on? Yeah, I've seen crazy urine tests, but more to the point, I've seen crazy solutions for urine tests. Uh, everybody says, oh, those solutions, they don't work. They don't. Actually, if I really had to take a drug test tomorrow, um, I would probably use one of the, the many flushes of the test, or maybe even a device. You know, you use the uh, the fall phallus that they have out there, um, the wisnator, the urinators, that kind of thing. But, um, but it, there's a lot of other ways that people try to get out of the drug test, and, and most of them are apothecal. I mean, uh, the best one I've ever heard, the best one, came from no less a source than Kyle Cushman, the great, the great uh, cultivator, and he was telling me about many, many, many years ago, long before he was Kyle Cushman, he had to uh, take a drug test, and he was going to be obviously fail for marijuana. So what he did was he took a little bit of powdered bleach, and he put it inside the tip of his finger. And then when he took his, gave his sample and he was ex- and putting out urine, he put his finger in the stream and the powdered bleach screwed up the, uh, the test. And it, it, didn't, it, didn't, it, didn't make it, uh, it didn't make it passable, but it made it, uh, he'd have to do it again. It brought him some time. <laughs> But, Crazy steps you know, we yeah, I mean, these days they're both they're very sophisticated with their flawed testing, and we're very sophisticated with our flawed with our our good solutions. So, um, as I would say, uh, if you are in a workplace drug test and you need to get out of your workplace drug test, the best thing for you to do is abstinence. That's the first thing, okay. And but but if you're a heavy marijuana smoker. If you're a little bit heavy set or something, it stays in the fat cells of your body. It could be in your system for two, three, up to four weeks, maybe even more. So what you got to do is, if that's the case, is you got to look to some of the solutions and some of the, uh, the devices that they have that will get you out of there. It's about decreasing the odds. There's no guarantees, but you can decrease the odds to the point where you pass. Exactly, exactly. Hey, you mentioned your daughter's birth, and I know she's a teenager now, and that's got to be uh, pretty wild. Anything you'd like to say about cannabis? Uh, yeah, Garrett? what a ride. Uh, she's um, she's going to be 18 in three months. 
and uh, she's graduating high school next month. And my daughter, I've been at High Times, uh, for those of you paying close attention, for 18 years. My daughter is 18 years old, so I've never been a dad, but that I've worked at High Times. And I've never been at High Times, but that I've been a dad. And to put an even weirder twist on it is I raised her pretty much by myself. So it's just been me and her and marijuana. <laughs> and so I told my daughter really early in the game what was happening. I told her uh, the truth about what I did for a living, knowing she would find out anyway. And I, to be honest with you, I wasn't sure that was a good idea. I, I, I felt it was my best, my best choice. It was not lying to her. And actually, by telling her the truth about marijuana at a younger age, telling her what I believed, and telling her that I wasn't supposed to tell her this, but I didn't want to lie to her, what I happened was I got an extra layer of honesty created between us. She suddenly knew that you know, me telling the truth to her was important, and that I was willing to take a chance at telling her the truth. And, and that closeness, that extra level of honesty has remained intact right up to today. And my daughter and I are very close. I've asked her to uh, not smoke marijuana until she gets to be an older teenager, if she feels like it. I've also told her that if she never smokes marijuana, that's fine with me. And uh, to my best of my knowledge, she still hasn't, but what do I know? I'm her dad. <laughs> It's let's interesting. Not this, let's not be foolish about this. <laughs> I mean, it's a, a part of a much bigger relationship. It really is just a, one small aspect of a multifaceted interaction you guys have. Yeah, and and the thing is, is you know what's interesting? My experience about talking about marijuana and a, a lot of faceted conversations about marijuana with my daughter is it reminded me of the conversations I had with her about religion previous to our conversation about pot. I mean, it was, if, if you're talking about something that somebody, some people believe in and some people don't believe in, and some people think is, is wonderful and some people think is, you know, pernicious and, and damaging, and if you're talking about something that people can argue about, you know, passionately and never come to a conclusion, am I talking about pot or am I talking about religion? <laughs> or guns. Yeah, or guns, absolutely, <laughs> or guns. Another thing that I found, another set of, uh, of um, par parallels I found in the marijuana conversation. And, uh, and it's funny, you know, talking about marijuana with my daughter has helped me talk to her about religion and has helped me talk to me about guns. Um, no surprise, uh, she, she's not very much of a gun person. She didn't grow up in a gun household. But also, I, I've had conversations with her, I said, you know, we have to be open to other people's viewpoints because I'm asking other people who don't know about what I'm talking about to be open to my viewpoint. Oh, uh, what and a great lesson, Rick. That's really super. I, I think that there's a lesson there for all of us. You know, we really have to be open to what we don't agree with. Exactly. Hey, I know you remember the days of hemp times, and I feel like I we do. all thought hemp was going to sort of be our path that kind of medical marijuana took. Do you yep. have any views on that? Wow, what a great question. I never get asked that question anymore, and I really like that question. Um, you know, it's true. Back in the 90s, there was a small renaissance of hemp, but um, even back then, I felt, uh, I, I'm in the business department of High Times, even back then, I felt as a businessman that until we got a domestic crop, that you, the hemp industry was not going to take off because you had to import every you know piece of hemp that you had in the country from China or from Soviet, former Soviet bloc countries. And uh, that put an extra financial burden on the whole thing. And so getting a domestic crop was the goal. We didn't get it back then, and, and hemp kind of died on the vine, so to speak. But now, um, in the past couple of years, they've legalized marijuana. Uh, most sexily, <laughs> most sexy is the, is the, uh, legalized marijuana, recreational marijuana and medical marijuana business. And there are fortunes being made right now, of course. So all those guys went to that right away because it was where the action was. But hemp is sitting in the wings and hemp is the 800 pound gorilla on the field. Marijuana is huge. 
And it will, and once it's legalized throughout this country, it's going to create a multi-billion dollar industry. It's going to be a benefit for everyone concerned. But you can only sell that marijuana to people who smoke marijuana. You can sell hemp to everybody. And you can sell hemp to everybody in the world. And you can, all the reasons we wanted to do hemp in the first place, that it was better for the environment than cotton, that it was better for the environment than petroleum-based synthetics, those are still true. It's environmentally sound, and now that marijuana is legal, very shortly they're going to get to hemp, and you're going to see in the 21st century, the hemp industry is going to create a brand new market that might even dwarf the cannabis industry. Wow, what a pleasant thought, man. I really I really think that's great. Listen, I, everybody... It's all about options. The options yeah. are coming in, and, and eventually all the options will be taken. Everybody knows you must meet some of the coolest people in the world in your job. Are there any sort of celebrity gossip things you'd be comfortable telling us about, or... Good ah, celebrity gossip. I don't know. I, um, I, I'm i really glad if the uh, uh, last issue of High Times had my interview with Whoopi Goldberg. And uh, I met Whoopi Goldberg recently, and she was uh, actually lives near my house. And um, I, in the course of uh, doing the High Times interview with her, uh, she was gracious enough to open her home up to me for three or four days straight. And I hung out with her, and she has got to be the coolest person I've ever met in my entire life. And just what you think Whoopi Goldberg is like is exactly what she's like. And um, and she was very, very open and generous at times, which a person in that position does not have to be, you know? It's uh, it's no big shake for uh, for Willie Nelson to admit that he smokes weed. <laughs> but but uh, Whoopi works for ABC. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, so I was very impressed with Whoopi Goldberg and, uh, and, her, entire, uh, and her entire world. And that, that interview is stellar, man. I really appreciate you doing it. Ah, she's are a there, great woman. Are there places to, uh, I guess we better actually get, have to call it a day, Rick. Gosh, I could talk to you all day long, man. I, I really appreciate it. Anytime, but I'll tell you something. Um, the Whoopi Goldberg interview will be put up in the next uh, few weeks online. You can read it online at www.hightimes.com. Perfect, man. All right. Well, thanks so much, for everybody, for joining us on Burning Issues. And my hearty thanks yet again to Rick Cusick. Thanks again, Mitch. A pleasure being here. Hate to say goodbye. This is Dr. Mitch Earlywine for Burning Issues. We've been chatting with Rick Cusick of High Times Magazine. And we'll be right back with self-compassion in the art of activism. More Burning Issues coming up after we blaze through these words from our sponsors. InternetMarketingNinjas.com is the online dojo of the highly trained and skilled Internet Marketing Ninjas. Disavow documents, reconsideration requests, Panda and Penguin penalties. Let our superior SEO ninjas confront all of your link-related issues. The Internet Marketing Ninjas are equipped to master any marketing exercise, content creation, authorship, link building, PPC, and more. Plus, build more buzz for your brand with our social media marketing strategy. Discover all that the Internet Marketing Ninjas can do for you. Visit the online dojo now at internetmarketingninjas.com. Hi, I'm Montel Williams. Most of you know me as a talk show host, but I'm also an author, actor, single father of four, a fitness writer, avid snowboarder, and I'm also a medical marijuana patient. Like many of the million people who are living with multiple sclerosis, I'm in pain every single day. And sometimes my nerves are so raw that if you brushed up against me in an elevator, I'd scream. I can't sleep at night from the pain, and sometimes the spasms in my legs are so intense they will wake me up throughout the night. I've tried the strongest prescription medications available, and I'm gonna tell you, they do not work. In fact, they leave me in a stupor, and most of the time, it's impossible to even live your life. Now, I've tried medical marijuana, and I'm gonna tell you something, it works. If you'd like more information about medical marijuana, you can contact the Marijuana Policy Project at mpp.org or call 1-877-JOIN-MPP. Cannabis commerce continues to cultivate new markets for adventurous entrepreneurs. 
CannabisRadio.com welcomes the adventurous to Cannabis and Commerce. Presented by GreenBiz.com, this show brings together cannabis entrepreneurs and industry experts to discuss today's important cannabis issues. Our discussions will chronicle the challenges faced by cannabis owners and the battles surrounding cannabis nationwide. Cannabis and Commerce, on demand anytime, only on CannabisRadio.com. Time to fan the fire on some more burning issues, only on CannabisRadio.com. And we're back. Thanks for joining us on Burning Issues. Time for self-compassion and the art of activism, the segment where our listeners can learn to take good care of themselves and each other. Given that it's part of the title, I thought it was time to finally talk about self-compassion. What is it? I realize self-compassion sounds like something for guys in robes shaving their heads. And academics can be kind of hair-splitting at times, but my favorite definition comes from Dr. Kristen Neff. Dr. Neff emphasizes that self-compassion is all about treating yourself with the same kindness and care you'd give a friend. Imagine that, showing yourself the same understanding you'd give to a treasured buddy. So self-compassion is about being gentle and sympathetic toward you. It includes giving yourself the benefit of the doubt, especially when things go awry. Self-compassion means warmth and acceptance. It's about letting go of blame and letting go of criticism. Imagine talking to yourself inside your head the same way you talk to someone you loved. Dr. Neff spearheaded the work on self-compassion, and she's got great meditations and exercises at self-compassion.org. Research in her lab and my lab and many others around the country suggests that self-compassion can really be the key to finding purposeful, meaningful happiness. In a way, self-compassion is communication. It's just communication with yourself. It's easy to show it when life is great, but the best time to show self-compassion is often when things are going kind of awry. That's the ideal time to let go of rumination and perfectionism. That's the time to cut yourself some slack, to remember that everyone makes mistakes. Do you expect everyone else to do everything flawlessly every second of every day? Of course not. So why hold yourself to a tougher standard? Hey, I hate to admit it, but we're all only human. Think how nice you can be to your friends. What a good listener you are. How warm and forgiving you can be. How sincere and thoughtful and kind. Now turn all that towards you. That's self-compassion in a nutshell. Fortunately, we can learn self-compassion. It's like riding a bike. Well, maybe more like a unicycle. It can take practice but once you get going, it's really fun. But like riding a unicycle, it's a perishable skill. We have to keep at it or we find ourselves flat on the asphalt. So how's self-compassion done? We've talked about catching our own thoughts before, how they come and go inside our heads. They really do bounce around like a drunken monkey. And sometimes we even start believing them. But there are moments when we recognize thoughts for what they are. Moments when we say, there's my mind doing its thing again. And that's when mindful minds are caught in what they're doing. And as soon as you can interrupt, that's a great first step. Once we recognize our thoughts for what they are, we're on our way. What are those ch thoughts chattering about anyway? Odds are high, they can be pretty negative not the kind of thing that would make us feel valued or understood. What we really have to do then is substitute the self-compassionate thoughts. It's a simple idea, but it's not easy. At first, it might not even be particularly convincing. But each time we do it, we're going to get better and better. We're going to make a better case for self-compassion. I had one relevant example recently. I bet you can relate. It involved hitting reply all. Nothing good ever came from hitting reply all. You guessed it. The troublesome email that I intended to send to one colleague went right to a bunch, including the wrong person. This one really made my mind go crazy. 
there you go again, it said, in case you didn't already have enough people who hate you, and now everyone really knows you're an idiot. I was eating disaster soup with a grief spoon, wallowing in freakish misery. But then I caught my mind doing its thing. I decided to go for self-compassion and said, I decided to treat myself like a good friend. My new thoughts were, hey, yeah, it really is a drag that I hit reply all. I really have a mess to clean up now. But you know what? The stings, but these things happen. They're a part of life. I'm certainly not the only person to ever hit reply all. This isn't the complete end of all humanity. I, I think I can forgive myself for this one. So no more disaster soup with a grief spoon. I still had a little pile of trouble in a bowl of hassle, but I could choke it down. It didn't turn stress into fun, but self-compassion made what looked like a huge problem into something I could manage. Then I got to move along to bigger and better things. So catch your mind when it's mean. Make a friend of yourself. Show yourself that self-compassion you'll be glad you did. I'm Dr. Mitch Earlywine. My effusive thanks to producer extraordinaire Brosco and our guest Rick Cusick of High Times. Thanks so much for joining us on Burning Issues. Follow your heart and let the data be your guide. The opinions expressed on this Canada's Radio Network program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff or management of Cannabis Radio Network. Any rebroadcast or retransmission without proper consent of the Cannabis Radio Network is prohibited.